Hi, welcome to the C++ guide for the JS developer. I'm Oscar Frankel. I'm a software developer from Bolivia, but I live in Germany. I have worked a lot with React Native in a lot of companies and released several apps. And lately I've been getting into the JSI, which is the new communication layer for React Native between JavaScript and the native code. Now, if you have never heard about the JSI, it's a communication layer which is implemented on the JavaScript engine itself, which is supposed to cut the runtime of any JavaScript function that needs to interact with the native side of um, your application. Now, there's one big problem with the JSI right now, which is the documentation is pretty much non-existent. The community has been doing a lot of work on its own, trying to understand it and to use it. Um, nowadays, there are a little bit more guides, but there's still a lot of terrain to cover. So this guide is aimed for React Native developers who want to write uh, JSI modules. But actually, this part, the C++ part, is for any JavaScript developer who wants to learn a little bit more about C++. Now, um, I'm going to be going over certain topics. Uh, they are written on a guide that I wrote. You can actually buy it if you want uh, to have a written version. But I'm not going to focus too much on the very basic stuff, like how to declare a variable, how to do for loops. There's a lot of documentation out there for this kind of stuff. This is truly aimed at the JavaScript developers who already know how to code. Uh, they just need to code on C++, right? So I'm just going to focus on the very important and different points of C++ from uh, JavaScript side of things, and uh, which will allow you to be very productive very fast. Now, I'm also not going to use my own environment to code on C++ because it might be different to yours and that's not the focus of this video. I just want you to learn C++ and we can get into how to set up your machine into a different video, right? This is just boring. I want you to learn the important stuff. So I'm just going to use an uh, online sandbox. I'm using the Repolit uh, C++ sandbox, which the moment I, from the moment I open the app, I can hit run and this will compile the C++ and run it for me. Great. So, um, like I said, I'm not going to go over how to declare a variable and all the basic stuff. I'm going to talk to you about the more interesting things. So the first thing that I would like to talk about is a little bit about compilation, not the entire topic, but just enough to get you started. So, of course, to compile a C++ program, you need a C++ compiler. In this case, the Repolit sandbox is using Clang but there are multiple compilers. Um, you shouldn't worry too much about this. If uh, you're also coding on React Native, this should already be part of the compilation chain of the platform you're using. But uh, for now, we're using Clang. You can also see that we are specifying a specific version of C++. Um, each version will have different features available to you, um, but we're not going to go too specific into that. Now, one interesting point about C++ programs is that the output, the first output of the compilation is an object file, right? An object file is not a direct executable, not necessarily. Um, an object file is the mm, one step before a standalone binary, right? So. In this case, you can see the Repolit is going to call clang into the main C++ file. And then it's going to pass this parameter, the O parameter, which is telling to link the output of the compilation, which is also going to be called main, into a binary. So you need to link your object files with the dependencies, the dynamic libraries or static libraries that you want to use. This is the main difference, right? So your program gets compiled into an object file. If you're using any dynamic library, you won't be able to run it until you link it. And when you link it, 
then you will get a standalone executable. You can port to a different machine, you can send it and, and execute it just fine. So Repelit has compiled the file for us and then it just immediately executes the file. This is basically how C++ programs get compiled. Later down the road, we will look into tools that automate this because as you get more files, you have to compile and link all of them. So there's actually tooling to solve this problem. So we can now start to take a look into our C++ program itself. It's fairly standard. You have a main function, which is called by default. Um, it needs to have a return of type int. And inside of it, we can do, you know, whatever we want. Now, on this first lesson, I want to talk about the preprocessor. So whenever you need to compile a program, there are different stages. Um, on C++, there, the initial stage, which is actually not a compilation stage, is the preprocessing of your file. Basically, a preprocessor is a program that's going to go through your program to your actual code and take a look into these special directives, which are prefixed with the hashtag. And it's going to do certain manipulations to your program uh, based on these uh, statements. So the very first statement that we will see is this include statement. The include statement is just going to take you whatever you pass to it. In this case, this is the name of a library. This library is part of the C++ standard library. So you don't actually have to um, provide the files or this is not a dynamic library. This is part of the standard library, right? So this will just work whenever you tell it to include. So the preprocessor is going to look into this statement and then it's going to fetch the contents of the iostream library and it's going to replace them inside of your code. Right, so I don't know how this is implemented, but let's just say, you know, this pro there's probably some functions in there, you know, the cout function, for example, which is the function that we're calling down here. Right, here comes the implementation of the cout function. There's probably also the cin function that also has its own implementation and so on and so forth, right? All the content of the std library is going to be uh, replaced on your program. So you can see how the preprocessing stage is very, very powerful, right? It allows you to modify your program just before the compilation starts. But there are some criticisms to this model because it's too powerful, right? You don't really know the compiler cannot really help you until the preprocessor has modified your program and this it can be modified in unexpected ways and also dangerous ways. So it's not a perfect approach, but it is how it works. Now, there are another uh, few statements that are really, really useful. One of these statements is the conditional statement. So for example, I can say if, and here I can use an environment variable, for example, right? Um, I'm just going to use POSIX C source, which is um, just going to check if I'm compiling for a POSIX compatible um, source. So let's say Linux or Mac OS, right? And here, let's say I'm going to create a variable, for example. This might not actually compile, but this is just a, a illustration of the point. Then uh, if this is not a POSIX source, then I'm going to declare something different. And then I can finally close my if. So once again, you have to think the preprocessor runs before compilation. So whenever I tell the C++ compiler, this is going to get executed. If I'm compiling on a macOS machine or for a macOS machine, then the preprocessor is going to replace everything that's not um, declared under the macOS source. Um, the other case also happens for the, let's say, a Windows machine, right? There, the flag gets evaluated to false. 
and then this is all I'm left with. Another um, annotation, another statement that you will see very often is the define statement. So for example, here I can define, you know, my number, let's say like this, for example. And here on my program, I can just use it like this. So once again, you have to think the preprocessor runs before compilation. So in this case, this is not really a variable. What will happen is that the preprocessor will remove this definition and will replace all the instances with the actual value. You might actually gain a little bit of performance if you do this. Um, do whatever um, as you wish with it. Great, so this was just the first part of the C++ guide. There are many topics. We will cover um, a lot of terrain. We're starting with the basic stuff, with a very basic notion of how the compilation works, of the preprocessor. And we will move further to more advanced topics like memory management and pointers, etc., etc. I hope you enjoyed the video and please consider subscribing. Thanks.